Thank you. Thank you. So I, I'm glad you mentioned veterinary technicians, because if any of you watching this uh, happen to be of that persuasion, uh, certified, licensed, or registered technician, thank you, uh, because I believe uh, you are underutilized, underpaid, and sometimes underappreciated. And uh, this profession could not be, would not be what it is. I don't even know if I'd be giving this talk if it wasn't for technicians doing what you guys do every single day. So give yourself a round of applause if you happen to be a technician. All right. So this is one of the, as I'll talk about, my nose itches. I think with the warmer weather coming, hay fever is here. Uh, so that's what that's about. But that's not what this talk is about. It's about one of the most common behavior problems that we see in dogs. Whoa, are we not going to advance? Hold on, hold on. What's going on here? Okay. Hmm. So why aren't my slides? There we go. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Super Bowl. Did you watch the Super Bowl? There was a TV commercial I want you to watch now. And... You tell me, or think about anyway, why I was so upset after seeing this. A happy ending, but. Life is brief, but when it's gone, life goes on. There's a train and you can Life is brief. But when it's gone, it's gone. Okay, so what's wrong with that commercial? Um, well, a couple things. First of all, uh, you don't introduce dogs that way, which is not what this talk is about, right? But that is no way to introduce new dogs to one another. That aside, uh, a solution to separation, anxiety, and truth is not to get another dog you could end up potentially solving the problem. However, much more likely, you're going to have two dogs now with separation anxiety. So that in of itself is not the solution. So yeah, they went back to work, that family did in the commercial or wherever they went to school. And we saw uh, post-pandemic, we're seeing potentially, we don't know for sure, uh, more separation anxiety. Uh, so. What dogs are most likely now to have separation anxiety? Dogs that previously suffered anxiety and then we were all home through the pandemic, or at least some of us were, that was a big change for the dogs, a good one for most dogs, but then everyone disappears again. Those dogs that previously had separation anxiety, from the data we know, are more likely to have it yet again. Shelter dogs, rescue dogs, particularly those rehomed several times. There is no data to suggest that dogs, just because they are from shelters, are more likely to have separation anxiety because they may have been given up in the first place because they have separation anxiety. So we don't know that. But what we do know is that dogs that have been rehomed several times are more likely to have the issue or bounce from shelter to shelter, shelter to a rescue to a shelter, that kind of thing. Change can be upsetting for some of us, right? How many of you had a tough time through the pandemic where others said, hey, I'm just going to go for a run every day or dealt with it? So we deal with change in different ways, depending on our individual personalities. The same is true for dogs. So what is separation anxiety in the first place? Maybe that dog is chewing up 
the pillows there or howling because perhaps the dog is bored. Is the dog truly under exercise? Well, I'll talk about how exercise can be helpful as a part of the solution. It isn't in of itself a solution. Uh, dogs that have totally no exercise, they may act out, for lack of a better way of putting it, in a way that looks like separation anxiety, but truly isn't. They're actually having a good time. Uh, a dog who is just never taught to be home alone. A dog that truly isn't house trained. So people come home and they find some piddle, and it turns out that the problem is that the dog was never house trained right in the first place. Uh, the dog goes to the window and does what this foster dog is doing right now, barking just a bit. I don't know if you could hear it or not, but that dog doing that, uh, it's self-reinforcing to bark at people going by, right? You bark, the people go away. That's fun uh, for a dog anyway. So that's fun. It's not separation anxiety. And the potential of canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome as well which I'll talk a bit more about. So we have separation anxiety signs in those dogs, but it's a little different because we're dealing essentially, right, with Alzheimer's and dogs more or less. Okay, so what is separation anxiety? It is sometimes separation from a specific person. More often, it's actually isolation distress. And many times, in fact, if most times, if it's really separation anxiety, what we're talking about is a panic attack. Here is a very pretty slide of what separation anxiety signs may look like. How many signs is it? We don't know. I mean, the, the, I, could, I could make up something, but we don't know the answer to that. So sometimes a dog that is just out pick destruction truly has severe separation anxiety and is not exhibiting these others. Some dogs, the separation anxiety is just as severe and may exhibit three or four of these or more, you know? So it just depends on the dog. And by the way, I'm not sure this whole thing with severe separation anxiety compared to mild. Um, you're in a room, how many of you are afraid, terrified maybe of spiders? I put one of you who is in a room with 300 spiders, a very small room, like a tiny closet. And you may, uh, you may uh, exhibit, you may scream, you may jump up and down, you may pound on the door, get me out of here. You may try swatting at the spiders, whatever. Another person though, can just go into a corner and have, um, what's the term that I'm looking for? You're, you're just as panicked, but you don't exhibit the same sort of panicky signs. Do you follow what I mean? So we tend to say that dogs with separation anxiety that have all these different signs have more severe anxiety. We don't know what that dog is really feeling who just might be scratching at the door. It may be the same. Does that make any sense? I cannot see your heads nodding, but I hope that it does. So here's an example of separation anxiety, and I'm going to go through this because it's a long video. So I'm gonna go through it in spurts. You could hear the dog whine a little bit, right? And we think crating is the answer to separation anxiety can actually make things worse for some dogs. For some dogs, it's part of the solution. It just depends on the dog. Now the dog is expressing more distress. The dog we're fostering is looking at this video. I don't want the dog we're fostering to panic. You see the uh, hyper salivation there as well. It's okay, Gracie. Oh my goodness. It's okay. <laughs> and now we have a dog that could have uh, break teeth, right? Break nails and is certainly breaking the crate. And before my dog here panics, we, I'm fostering a dog who actually does have some separation distress, we just found out. I know, I know. Uh, so which breeds, if any, are more predisposed? So there are lots of studies about this. And here's the thing. 
I put up one according to one study. Read a different study and you probably will see different breeds. We don't really know the answer if there's breed predisposition to that or not. We do know that most dogs express the separation anxiety that they have between the age of about a year to five years. However, we see a big jump again with dogs with canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome. Almost all, 98%, show more than one sign of anxiety. So, and I'll talk more about that. 20% to 40% of all behavior problems now, and in one study, 14 to 40% of referral cases to uh, uh, veterinary behaviorists. Uh, more adoptions, well, I, I don't know. Shelter dogs do seem to be overrepresented, but why is that the case, as I mentioned earlier? We really don't know the answer to that for sure. Neutering uh, turns out to be a sign of separation anxiety. Are they really cause and effect? No, I don't think so. But most dogs are neutered, therefore, therefore, or spayed. And therefore, we see separation anxiety more in those dogs. Is it because most dogs are neutered or spayed? Probably. Uh, but I put it up there anyway. Uh, uh, interesting that single adults living with a dog, that dog is more likely to have separation anxiety, maybe because that dog is hyper attached to that person. Don't know the answer as to why. Dogs with one anxiety issue, as I said, are more likely to have others. And here we see from a CC Animal Health. Now there's other data out there, but the data all look similar. So other loud noises in some studies, maybe 42%. Fireworks in some studies, maybe 32%, you know, close. So statistically, they're all about the same. The point is, no matter what study you look at, dogs with separation anxiety are likely to have another sign of anxiety as well. Why is it important? Well, it's important because it's a quality of life issue for the dog. Also, the family that's living with that dog as well, right? Uh, if you've ever lived with a dog with separation anxiety yourself, you know how difficult it can be. I know people that haven't wanted to leave their home because that dog has separation anxiety, and they don't until they absolutely need to. Uh, and it's also uh, one sign of relinquishment in dogs as well, a significant one. So I have what you'll never see in any other talk, the cure for separation anxiety. Here it is. Get a cat. Okay, that's not really the cure for separation anxiety. Okay, so here are some myths. And these myths are from the internet, they're from people I've talked to, clients, I mean, clients of yours, I'm sure you have heard this before too. Pet parents saying, I caused it. It's my fault because the dog sleeps in my bed. It's my fault because I kiss my dog a lot. No, it's not your fault. And it's not your client's fault. Separation anxiety isn't treatable. Of course it is. That's why I'm here and I'll talk about that, I promise. Uh, but some online sources indicate that it's not treatable. I keep looking down at the foster dog because she keeps looking at this video that I'm presenting and the PowerPoint that I'm presenting, and I don't want her to get upset because we're also dealing with house training issues. Medications only a last resort. No, 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 no. And you probably know that, and I'll talk more about that. Now, I'm a certified animal behavior consultant. I'm not going to dive deep into medications because I'm not a veterinarian. I ought not do that, right? However, I will discuss what the medications in general do and why they may be necessary. Only rescue or adopted dogs get separation anxiety. I've talked about that already. Not true. The dog isn't well trained enough. Well, separation anxiety isn't an issue of training or intelligence. The dog can be a Mensa dog, graduated from Harvard, uh, from obedience class, uh, superb obedience class, extra superb obedience class, has all these certifications after the dog's name and still have separation anxiety. You can't sue the dog with separation anxiety. Well, yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, you cannot, and separation anxiety is a panic attack, right? It's based on emotion. So, so for you to come home as a client or your clients to come home and cuddle their dog, that's not going to solve the problem. It won't create the problem, but it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, dogs with separation anxiety must be crated sometimes, but maybe not. So what doesn't work? 
getting another pet. Uh, so if you get a, a, a dog with another dog who has separation anxiety, it's possible. There are certainly instances of that dog solving the problem right there. And if the separation anxiety occurs, maybe because the, of the death of another dog, and that dog was so dependent on that dog who passed away, absolutely, I'd say it's a possibility. Possibility, because they may not have the same relationship, right? However, what happens more often, as I spoke about, is now you may have a client with two dogs with separation anxiety. More exercise is great, but it's not the cure to separation anxiety. It's a part of the solution in many cases, but that in of itself isn't going to do the trick for true separation anxiety. What you'll have is you'll have a very tired dog with separation anxiety. Being the pack leader, yeah, there's a TV host who talked about that, and that is the most ridiculous thing ever. Uh, yes, be a good teacher. Encourage your clients to be a good teacher for their dogs, to teach their dog things. But uh, the whole part about being a pack leader is ridiculous anyway. Dogs know we are not other dogs, for starters. It seems to be common sense, you'd think. That has nothing to do, you being in charge or your clients being in charge or not, with separation. It's nothing to do with separation anxiety. Punishment, uh, that does not work. In fact, it's separation anxiety. So we know punishment creates anxiety in dogs. So uh, this is not spite, and it's not the dog getting back at their people. So they walk in the door, they're not acting or sounding angry, but this dog knows. What did you do? Not what it did. What does the dog know? It knows through their body motions, maybe pheromones for all we know, and the way they are responding that these people are upset at them, even though their tone of voice is not angry. Dogs still know. And this dog is not uh, acting guilty. And this dog didn't urinate out of spite. It urinated because this dog has separate or had, maybe not now, separation anxiety. Okay, tools to help identify canine separation anxiety. There is no yet. Uh, evaluation per se for that. However, there's a quiz. It's like a good housekeeping seal of approval type quiz that's available on this website. And there are some others available online. You could take parts of what I say and put that together and create your own quiz if you'd like. Um, be proactive. So tell your clients who just acquired it doesn't matter where, through a breeder. And by the way, dogs acquired through breeders, they absolutely can have separation anxiety. It's not only shelter dogs by any means. Or if they, from a foster or from a shelter or rescue, wherever they got the dog from, to leave the house, maybe not the first day or two or three, but to leave the house. And when they do, to set up a camera, cameras are now, now, hey, six years ago, eight years ago when I gave this talk, I said, set up a camera with hesitancy. 15 years ago, when I gave a talk like this, I didn't say anything about cameras because they really didn't exist like they do now. With hesitancy eight years ago, because they cost so much money. Today, they're pretty cheap. I mean, I think, I mean, I've seen them on Amazon, a single camera rather than a two or three camera system uh, for uh, 30 bucks. Uh, and I'm told they're available for less. So, they're not terribly expensive. And yes, having more than one camera is better than having one. But if you have one or your client has one, focus on the door the client left the house from, because that is most likely where the dog is going to express that anxiety. Put out some good stuff. Hong toy stuff with peanut butter, safe stuff, particularly if it's a puppy. We want whatever is left out to be safe. But to see if two things, that camera goes right to your phone, your client's phone. I keep saying your phone, your client's phone. Also, when your client gets back, the client can see if the dog, assuming it's a food motivated dog, ate what was left. You can actually see what's going on, right? And here's the thing. Clients will see that a dog may be barking. And it's, it harkens back to that slide about the very beginning of the talk. 
The dog may be barking. The dog may be running around in circles. The dog may be scratching at the carpet. It might not be separation anxiety. That dog couldn't be having a great time. And here's what I tell pet parents. You wouldn't diagnose diabetes in a dog or heart disease. This is, in my personal opinion, of which on occasion I do respect, it's a medical decision. It really is. Because you're professionals who can look at that video and say, that dog's having a party. This is not separation anxiety. Yes, you need to teach the dog uh, crate training because the dog is chewing up all these pillows. But it's not separation anxiety. You can tell by the body language in a way the pet parent may not be able to. The dog is barking at the window because the UPS guy was there. The barking, the UPS guy goes away. Dog says, I did my job. That is annoying to neighbors if that client lives in a condominium or apartment building. However, it's not separation anxiety. All right, getting to the meat of things. This guy, if you ask him to do some mathematical problem or to learn one, this is not a good time for that, right? You can't learn if you're panicked or terrified. And the dogs with separation anxiety, true separation anxiety, are panicked and or terrified. So there are two big guns as far as solutions, in my opinion, and based on data, really. Forget about my opinion. It's really based on data. Pharmaceuticals. What they do, of course, you guys know this, is adjust the brain chemistry so the dogs then are more calm. They're able to potentially learn. And I'll talk about behavior modification in a moment. But they can learn. They can't if they're panicked. And the pharmaceuticals can change that. Some take some time to do so. Others can do so more immediately, right? I'm not going to talk about what they are, uh, but you probably know. But that is absolutely a solution. To be used instead of or in conjunction with pharmaceuticals is something else that you might not know as much about. And that's called the calmer canine. We're talking about targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy using physics, electromagnetic therapy, rather than drugs. And, and what the calmer canine does, so in dogs or humans, for that matter, that are panicked, our amygdala in our brain actually swells a bit. And instead of that serotonin running at whatever is normal for that individual dog or human, as I understand it, though my expertise, not in humans, uh, changes, and it changes and is replaced some by cortisol, which of course is the stress hormone, right? So this adjusts that over time. Sometimes it happens rather quickly. Some dogs, it takes a bit more time, which I'll talk about. Uh, it also induces uh, the production of endorphins like serotonin and dopamine rather than the panic dog, as I said, where uh, the dopamine and serotonin rates go down, and the cortisol goes up. The net effect is a reduction in neuroinflammation and a rebalancing of an overactive brain. It is the coolest technology ever, but there's science to show it, which I'll show you in a second. How to use it? There's a vest that comes in different sizes. So depending on the size of the dog, you choose the size of the vest uh, and or the client can just, you know, sit in there watching TV hold that ring part over the dog's head. So it can be handheld. Most people prefer the vest, but definitely at a time when the dog is calm, not when the dog is having the zoomies, this thing's going to fall off. Uh, treatment is done at home, not at the dog park. <laughs> Typically, it's four to six weeks. However, however, there are many cases, and I'll show you the data, where after one week, there is some success that quickly. Uh, the longer or subsequent treatment courses uh, are needed in some cases. So in some cases, it happens faster. In some cases, it may take a bit longer. Statistically significant reduction in signs of canine separation anxiety. I'll show you some video analysis in a minute. All dogs showed improvement from resolution of 50% or more. Lasting effects in two-thirds of the dogs. And if the dogs seem to uh, be, I hate to cured, sorry, that's the best word I can think of, 
Uh, the, oh, let me do it again. Take two. The problem is resolved, but then begins to reoccur using this all over again, the client using it all over again, no harm done. It can be done. And there are no known adverse responses. So this is one of the published studies that was done. Uh, you can look up the details of it if you like. Bottom line is the calmer canine really made an incredible difference. Dogs treated with the calmer canine showed a significant reduction in separation anxiety signs by six weeks of treatment. Uh, as I mentioned, it is safe, it's well tolerated, no adverse reactions as far as anyone knows, and dogs did show improvement. So the difference is st statistically significant between the active group and the placebo group. So here is one case study. I'll show you two. I could show you many more. This is Elliot, a three and a half year old male beagle. Uh, happily, there's no volume on this video because you know what this dog is doing. It's doing what uh, beagles do, right? Howling. So before the calmer canine is what we're saying. You see all these Kong toys and other toys all over. I'm told there's stuff with really good treats. Instead, this dog is pulling the stuff being out of the bed. So this dog is clearly showing signs of separation anxiety. This is before calmer canine treatment. And then I wanna to get to after, just moving it along a bit for the sake of time. Ah, so this is after. I think the video is actually playing. There we go, it's playing. There just isn't much, I think it's playing. So, I want to show you. it's playing. It doesn't look like it was playing because the dog is just standing there. He's fine. Um, so one month later, oh, now it's not playing. Oh my gosh. Why did it stop? Oh, really? Okay, one month later, it is playing now, I hope. No, it's not. What's going on? This isn't good. This should not happen. There, it's playing. I didn't do anything differently, I promise you. So it's playing now. One month later, the dog is acting perfectly normal, right? Um, walking around, investigating the room, uh, trying to get peanut butter or whatever is in that Kong toy. So here's the data before and one month after. I apologize. I don't know what happened with the video. This is what's important. So beagles will howl a bit. So we saw a bit of it later, but there's a significant difference there. So this dog was helped with the calmer canine. That's Elliot. And this is our second dog. Let's see if I can get the video to play. There we go. Ah, Cooper, 10-year-old male mixed breed dog. Interesting looking dog. Uh, Hypervigilant looking out the window. So separation anxiety is clear here, barking a bit at the door. It's not as obvious as in the first dog we saw, Elliot. But that helps make my point. Is this dog suffering any more or less than Elliot was? We don't know that. Dogs express these signs differently. So it doesn't necessarily mean, in my view, that one dog has more severe anxiety compared to another. So after one month, notice, these are after one month not six weeks of treatment, which is what the studies looked at. So this is even better for your clients, right? One month, four weeks, better than six weeks. Clearly, the, even the way the dog is laying down, you can tell this dog is relaxed. So watching exits, significant difference. Whining didn't even occur after a month. Uh, resting and grooming did occur after a month, did not occur at all before. And the barking lessened as well. So there's some practical issues here. It's a great first line defense for your clients that say, I don't want medication, I won't do it. And there are some dogs really that can't do it, maybe because of their age or uh, comorbidities. But while I disagree, I love the use, the appropriate use of psychopharmaceuticals in addition to calmer canine. There are clients, and I cannot see your heads nodding, but I give this talk all the time in person, and I do see heads nodding. There are clients 
increasing in number, perhaps, depending on where you happen to live in part, that say, I will not use drugs, period. So for those clients, this is a godsend, but can be used in conjunction with drugs. And the thing is, you may be able to titrate that dose down lower and lower and lower over time, and even over time more quickly eliminate the drug which is better for the clients, right? And their dogs, it is better for the dogs. Not against drugs, but it's better, right? It's better not to need them. Uh, the first choice in combination with behavior modification instead of drugs, as I mentioned for many clients, uh, a multimodal therapy in more severe cases, just use pharmaceutical and this. It can jumpstart improvement in stalled cases. And older dogs with a lower tolerance for medication, and as I said, some dogs with separation anxiety don't show it until perhaps they're 15 years old. And now we're talking about a dog that is also showing perhaps other signs of canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome. So this can help those dogs. And some of those dogs can not tolerate some of the medications. I want to talk about behavior modification. So what everything I've set up to here makes this part moving forward possible. A panic dog cannot easily learn if learn at all. So the only way you have your client has a shot really is to do something to minimize that anxiety. And that's something, especially if the landlord is not riding them or condo association, or maybe another dog in the house now begins to bark and show anxiety because of that one dog with anxiety. And your client says, I need to fix this tomorrow. Absolutely, medication. Absolutely, calmer canine. But until that's done, it's hard to do the behavior modification and have it be successful. So encouraging independence in the house. So teach your clients to have your dog sit or lay on a mat and encourage that dog to be on that mat. I've got to do this with this foster, uh, to be further and further away. So that dog, it's like going to college. That dog has some independence and some confidence that I can be away from the person. I don't know why. So when you leave to go to the supermarket yourselves, and you come home and you have a significant other, you've been gone for, I don't know, an hour or two, you come home, say, here are the groceries, hi, did I get any calls or whatever you say. With our dogs, we say, oh my goodness, I've been gone an hour, I can't believe it, that's why I need to see you, I need to see you, I love you, I love you, I love you. So telling your dog, I love you and kissing your dog, that's not gonna cause a problem. But for a dog that already has anxiety issues, to come home with that over-response, being greeted by a dog who is over-responsive, because most dogs with separation anxiety are, you're only ramping up the issue. So that's a no-no. The other thing is these dogs are ramped up. As I said, they all dogs are happy to see people, their people. However, these dogs are uh, over the top. They are, as I said, very often hyper-attached to these people. And the person comes home and these dogs are just over boundless, joyous. Wait till the dog calms down before you greet the dog. That's what you tell clients. Hard to do because you see the wiggling butt and the dog is so happy, but wait until the dog calms down. And this is also a good cure, by the way, for dogs that jump. You know, I, I walk into the house, dog jumps on me. So wait until the dog calms down then say hello in a calm voice, maybe pet the dog. Dog will go crazy all over again, probably. Wait it out until the dog calms down. You're teaching the dog to be calmer and that what your dog really wants or what this dog really wants is attention, right? So the way in which I get attention if I'm the dog is I have to be calm. Now, here's where I talk about exercise. Exercise is important depending on the kind of dog it is. So you're not gonna run a marathon with a pug, but you might with a Weimaraner, certainly that dog needs more exercise. 
the appropriate exercise for the age and breed or mix of the dog. That is important. It's not in of itself going to solve the problem. But as Dr. Ian Dunbar said, a good dog is a tired dog. So it is helpful. An enriched environment. Make life interesting. And some dogs require life to be interesting. A border collie, for example, right? So for all dogs, enrichment should be a law. Enriching the environment. It is really that, Im that important. Again, like exercise, it's not going to solve the problem, but it is a part of the solution. And certainly leaving things out for the dog to chew on, appropriate things for the dog to chew on, uh, stuffed food inside, appropriate toys that the dog can safely try to get out. That's all great. So uh, what are graduated departures? and how do they work? So a camera is a good idea for these. And what happens is your client leaves the house for 30 seconds. Maybe not, no, 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 10 seconds. Really, really 10 seconds. That they, they have to become their best actors. Like they really are going to, they grab their purse or their wallet, their coat if it's cold. They're really gonna leave and they go nowhere. Take a weekend, better a three day weekend to do this. Then the dog, you come back home, you greet the dog, like I said, you know, calmly, you require a calm greeting. After 10 or 15 seconds, even dogs with separation anxiety aren't likely to go that crazy. They come back home, sit down, watch TV, do a crossword puzzle, put the dishes in the dishwasher, whatever, and do it all over again. But this time, instead of 10 seconds, 25 seconds. And there's no rule you know, as a 10 second, 25 seconds, 40 seconds. I mean, there's no formula for this per se, but the idea is a formula. And you build up the time. Tell the client to build up the time. And once they hit like two minutes, back it up. So now they're gone for two minutes. The next time they're gone for a minute. The next time, three minutes. The next time, two minutes. The next time, five minutes. You kind of get the idea of what I'm saying. The camera is going. So if they see on their phone, their dog is distressed, they've done too much too fast. Now, should they do this while the dog is on whatever pharmaceutical of choice and having used the calmer canine? Absolutely. That's the whole idea. A dog that can still do this perhaps, but without pharmaceutical intervention, or intervention from the calmer canine, or both, things are way more difficult to do. And this can still be done. The problem with this, and I still like these graduated departures, the problem is, is that eventually the dog will have to be left alone for a longer period of time, and people aren't coming back for maybe six hours or whatever the time frame is, right? So that is not everyone's schedule. Some people can do this and build up to six or seven or eight hours. Most dogs, you don't want to leave a home alone more than eight or nine hours anyway, I hope. Because, you know, what can we expect? I mean, they got to go. That's where dog walkers come in. So that's another possibility. They care for some of these dogs. But many of these dogs actually regress if they go to daycare. It depends on the individual dog. So the problem with what I've just talked about, it's a lot. So another reason for using the calmer canine and or pharmaceuticals is that we know in giving complicated instructions to people and giving several of them, that compliance becomes a disaster. So I wanna give you some ideas uh, with the remaining time I have, some other options out there. And what works for one dog may not work as well for another dog. It just depends on the individual dog. And some people say, I don't want to pill my dog, which is another issue potentially with pharmaceuticals. I can't for whatever reason, maybe it's an older person. So some of these choices depend on the client and what that client is able and or wants to do. So 
Uh, many of these, by the way, can be used in conjunction with one another with no problem. Calming care, uh, Purina, uh, ProPlan Veterinary Supplements. It contains a probiotic. Uh, you probably know that, think about it, when you took a vet exam, maybe way back when, uh, and you felt the nervousness right there in your gut, right? But our brain talks to our gut. So it's not a surprise that a probiotic could, in fact, talk to your brain. And that, by the way, the science from this comes from human medicine. Uh, I mentioned these two nutraceuticals. There are a whole bunch out there, right? Uh, dozens, really, now. Uh, but most of them do not have science behind them. These two do. So anxetane L-theanine, it's an amino acid naturally found in green tea. Zilking contains a bovine-sourced hydrolyzed milk protein. It's like great-great-grandma said uh, at night. You have a test the next morning, take a warm glass of milk. You'll sleep better. And great grandma was right about that, probably. So uh, you could use these products with one another. Uh, it just depends also on what your client is willing and able to spend. Uh, Thunder shirt. Uh, there's the anxiety wrap. There's the storm defender, all things that dogs wear. Help some dogs. I'm not sure it helps all dogs. The Thunder Ease is simply a Thunder shirt with a Daptil infused in it. And then, of course, there's the pheromone product as well. So there are other things that are uh, things that you can do or tell clients to do in their home. The ceiling fan is not supposed to be about that. The ceiling fan is supposed to provide background noise. And why is that important? A lot of these dogs, not all of them, a lot of these dogs with separation anxiety uh, may be disturbed by outside noises. And because remember, they have other anxieties as well, and noise phobia, noise anxiety, whatever you want to call it, may be occurring too. So the dog isn't only anxious about being home alone, the dog is anxious about all those outdoor noises. So the whir of a ceiling fan can help. Uh, playing calming music, uh, and there's music specifically for dogs, as you probably know. Uh, turning on the radio, talk radio station, turning on a TV station, all of that can help as well. Now, this is a question I get asked a lot, CBD, and I don't know the answer to that. I do know this, at least to my knowledge, no study has been done on CBD and behavior, including separation anxiety. Now, studies are being conducted right now regarding behavior, if not specifically separation anxiety. We'll see what the results are in general about that. We know that CBD can help some things. I'm not degrading CBD at all. So there's a strong possibility maybe it will work. If you feel confident in suggesting this to your client, great. Part of it may depend on what you can do depending on where you happen to live. What's important to me is that the CBD product is also considered. So not to just go into a convenience store and tell your client to get anything made for dogs, give it a try, there's no downside. Well, potentially there is. In some of these products, there's actually been traces of cyanide found and other things that we would never ever want. The products are from China, to be honest, and that's that's concerning, you know, as opposed to some veterinary supported CBD products that are made in the USA. Don't these dogs look like little angels wearing the calmer canine. I think so. Here's where you can find me and learn more about me. And I've left for, and I hope you do, I hope you join my Facebook fan page and sign up for my newsletter and all that stuff. Uh, but I've left about five minutes or so for comments, questions. You can scream at me, you can laugh at me, you can do whatever you want. Uh, sound good? Awesome. Hello? Okay. Well, while we wait for any questions to roll in, just as a reminder, uh, your CE certificate will be sent out within 24 hours. So you'll have that. And you'll also uh, get a link to the recording of this webinar, which you can also go to zometica.com slash zometica university to view. And that will be up within a day as well. So we have. Sounds good. Uh, we've got a question from Morgan for clients who already own the Assisi Leap or Bed. Do these products decrease anxiety? 
so the question is, does the Assisi loop decrease anxiety? Yes. No, it's a different targeted wave. Um, I, I'm not sure the, the CC loop increases anxiety, but they're they're two different things. So the answer is no. It's a great product. So for animals who are suffering pain, the CC loop, as I'm sure you know, can be really helpful. But no, not the same waves, and therefore the answer is unfortunately no. I get the question all the time, though. Yes, we always do because they look similar. They do. They do. And the notion of what the product does is similar, if not identical, uh, but they're not at all identical in what they do. Uh, Cammie's wondering, so an owner with high anxiety over a pet can not cause anxiety in their pet? The owner has high anxiety and she wants to know if that can cause anxiety in their pet? I believe that's what's being yeah. asked. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I don't know. It's an interesting question regarding separation anxiety because I don't know that an anxious person can create separation anxiety specifically in their animal, but I don't know. I do know this, that our pets pick up on our emotions. I mean, we all know that, right? So that part, absolutely true. And if like you're in a, let's say your client's in a rush to leave the house and is all anxious about leaving because they just heard bad news, whatever that might be. And now I've got, oh, 10 minutes to get to where I want to go. And they grab everything and they stuff the dog into the crate or whatever. Uh, the, absolutely, the dog feels that anxiety. And a dog with separation anxiety, I would gather, would be more anxious than usual given that scenario, rather than the person calmly leaving the house and remembering to leave treats for the dog, et cetera. However, uh, I don't know that in general, uh, an anxious person will cause separation anxiety in their dog, but it's an interesting question. Um, have there been any studies with cats? Have several clients with cats that have anxiety? Yeah, so we do know cats can have separation anxiety as well as various other types of anxieties. We also know that cats can cause anxiety in people, but that's that's a whole other thing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, can the calmer canine be used on felines? Sure, but I didn't tell you to do it. It would be an off-label use that has not been studied, at least to my knowledge has not been studied. Have you looked at separation anxiety studies not from the U.S., such as Scandinavia, where pets are much less likely to be neutered, Devin is asking? No. And that's a really good question. What I don't know, wow, I love that question, because what I don't know, I mean, we raise our animals however we raise them in America. And separation anxiety is perhaps the most significant behavior problem anecdotally that I hear about, maybe even reaching cats thinking outside the box, which has always been way above and beyond anything else as number one. I wonder if other countries experience the same amount of separation anxiety commonly. Now, periodically, I'm lucky enough to speak in other countries. Uh, and I know in Mexico, it seems to be as, more or less, as common as it is here. But I don't know for sure about a lot of other countries, including Scandinavian countries you mentioned. I just don't know. But that's a great question. And I don't know if there's a genetic component. I don't know if it's how we raise the pets. I don't know if it's our lifestyles, because so many of us are so busy and gone so often. I don't know. Uh, do you have any recommendations for prevention of separation anxiety? Yeah. So it's what I said way early on, practice, practice, practice. So uh, as soon as you get that dog, again, not the first day two or three necessarily, but very early on when your client gets the dog, so many people stay home 24 seven with that dog for weeks, even, you know, don't do that. Tell your client to leave, leave good, try to set the dog up for success, leave good things out for the dog. So it's great when you leave. In fact, even better because you might get little pieces of hot dog 
or treats you would not otherwise get, have a camera on the dog and see if the dog's already exhibiting signs. If not, that's a good sign, but try to make it fun. Like I'm great, but if I leave, great things happen too. Will that prevent separation anxiety? We don't know is the honest answer to that. Can it be helpful? Might it work? Maybe. Uh, Sherry's wondering how long the calmer canine battery lasts and how you can tell when it's out of battery life. It doesn't blink is how you can tell when it's out. It doesn't give you a warning to my knowledge that it's running out. How long is an answer is a question maybe you can answer because I don't know the answer. Uh, so it definitely will last the whole six weeks of a treatment, um, but it's a basic lithium battery. Uh, so once it doesn't work, it's just a couple dollars to swap in a new one. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a magic. Yes, it absolutely lasts the six weeks, but I don't have a magic answer to that. Maybe there isn't one because we've all purchased batteries, you know, AA batteries or whatever at the store. And, oh my gosh, these batteries are lasting forever. You happen to notice that. And then you purchase batteries the next week and it's in whatever product it is for a week and they're dead, you know? So I, I don't know the answer to that. And my um, note, and, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Devin is mentioning that anxiety, they believe, has been shown to be hereditable in a couple studies, but yes. in specific rare breeds uh, and using guide dogs for the blind. And they can get references if you'd like. Sure, you could send me anything. Uh, my email is not up there, actually. So it's Pet World at stevedale.tv, or you can email me through my website. So yes, if you have any questions or want the proceedings, I'm, I'm more than happy to email them out to you. And yes, I'm aware that, as I said, I said this earlier, that uh, there probably is a genetic predisposition in, in dogs. We just don't know how that works. And we don't know if that's the sole explanation for separation anxiety. And one more from Devin, wondering sure. if they can get additional information on the exact mechanism of action of this product. Uh, and you can view that at ccanimalhealth.com. Um, we have a whole section on calmer canine, but uh, you can also email us at info at ccanimalhealth.com and we can give you those links if you need them. Give it a second to see if anyone has any additional questions before we wrap it up. You know, after the pandemic, what I was hearing a lot is I have separation anxiety from my dog when people went back to work. Do you have a product for that? Yeah, we definitely get people asking if they can use this on themselves. <laughs> and what's your what's your answer? We say, just like what you said about cats, you know, it's not tested <laughs> for that, but... Go for it. Yeah. I don't know that that's true separation anxiety in the same way. Actually, I would disagree with that answer. And, you know, you're probably kidding, you know, <laughs> but because with our dogs and cats that have true separation anxiety, it's a panic attack. Unless that person is actually suffering a panic attack. I don't know that this product would be necessary. I suspect it would do no harm, but I can't officially say anything about that. Any others? Well, uh, no other questions. So we'll give you guys back the rest of your hour. Um, and thank you so much, Steve, for an amazing talk. Oh, we thank you. To see exactly. everyone on a, another Zometica sponsored webinar next week. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Everyone really loved it. So. Well, thank you for the comments, and I thank you all for taking time out to watch. Have a good one, everyone.